Welcome everyone to Washington Crossing Historic Park, our um, inaugural 2020 lecture series. Uh, as some of you know, it was supposed to start a few months ago, but as all of you know, there have been a few hurdles along the way in the world that have prevented us from doing that. But now we are lucky to have a partnership with the Friends of Washington Crossing and we're able to bring you this lecture today um, via Zoom. So we are recording and there's something I need to read to everybody before we get started. A little bit of housekeeping. This session is being recorded for training and record keeping purposes. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention and use of this session. At any time, if you have a question or comment, feel free to place it in the chat, chat box and we will respond to you as soon as possible. If you would like to ask your question or to comment verbally, please note that by doing so, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of your statements recorded as part of this session. Now, just so you know, I, you probably noticed I have everybody's, um, uh, everybody muted. I'm going to keep it like that because we're expecting a lot of people. So if we have everybody jumping in, it's going to be a little bit chaotic. So questions can be put into the chat box. Um, our speaker is going to present, and then at the end, I will go through and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So you're all here because of this fabulous book. <laughs> it's called They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783. And it's by John Rees, who is our speaker here today. And let me tell you a little something about John. John Rees, a lifelong resident of Bucks County, has been writing about common soldiers' experiences in the War for American Independence for over 30 years on subjects ranging from battle studies, army food, and the soldier's burden, to army wagons and watercraft, campaign shelters, Continental Army conscription, and women with the army. His work has appeared in many publications, including Military Collector and Historian, Minerva, a quarterly report on women and the military, Percussive Notes, which is the Journal of the Percussive Art Society, and Gastromica, the Journal of Food and Culture, and Repast, which is the quarterly publication of the Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor. He was for 15 years a regular columnist for the quarterly newsletter, Food History News, writing on soldiers' food. Uh, he wrote four entries for the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, and 13 entries for the revised Thomason, uh, Thompson, I'm sorry, Gale edition of Boatner's Encyclopedia of the American Revolution. That and much, much more. Uh, John is a reenactor who is highly respected within the field and does amazing um, primary source documentation for all of the topics. And again, this is his book, I highly encourage you to all check it out um, wherever books are sold. And <laughs> <laughs> I will turn it over to him. And again, put all your questions into the chat box and I will monitor it. And then we'll circle back at the end of the talk and go through as many of them as we can. So without further ado, let me introduce John Rees. I'm going to spotlight you here. <laughs> and there you are. Welcome, John. Well, thank, thank you, Kim. Thank, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and it's also good to, uh, to see everybody uh, online. I can see a few people. I see a few people uh, inside and outside, which is kind of nice. Um, I, uh, I have a lot of pictures to show you. Um, so, uh, and I'll, 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 at the end, I'll come back, but uh, you will probably won't see me for most of the uh, presentation. Uh, so let's get, uh, let's get started here. Oops. There we go. Um, to begin my presentation, just I just want to give a, a, a taste of this complex subject, um, and in a relatively, and I'll I'll put quotes about around relatively a uh, short time. I hope to provide some idea of uh, African Americans' experiences, Continental Army soldiers, and uh, followers. Um, I'll bol bolster my talk with individual stories and tie it together with uh, some insights into soldier numbers. Um, 
much of my book is based around African American soldiers 19th century pension narratives where veterans, their friends or relatives tell about the soldier service, um, and often their civilian lives as well. Unless the race is specifically mentioned or references made to them or a member of their family being enslaved, most often the reader can't differentiate their account from a white or a Native American uh, continental veteran story. Unlike the segregated US military of the 19th and 20th centuries, revolutionary American military units, uh, continental, that means regular army, state and states and militia were with uh, only a few exceptions integrated. In connection with that, uh, well, I'll speak later of the segregated American 1st first, first Rhode Island Regiment, I want to briefly mention the two other largely all black regiments that served during the war. The earliest was the Loyalist Ethiopian Regiment. There we go. Um, it was formed in 1775 with freed slaves, mostly from Virginia by Virginia governor, uh, Royal Governor uh, John Murray Earl of Dunmore. That unit was disbanded after one year, and in March 1777, British Commander-in-Chief in America, Sir William Howe, directed that all Negroes, mulattoes, and other improper persons who have been admitted into Loyal's Corps be immediately discharged. So after that point, uh, black soldiers were not allowed in Loyal's uh, regiments, at least those supported by the Crown, um, at least, or at least under arms. They did serve as musicians and also, also as servants. Uh, Black loyalists did, however, serve in, uh, in, in loyalist militia units or, uh, or irregular units. Now, in March 1779, we'll turn to the French now. In March 1779, the French military uh, formed the Chasseur Volontaire de Saint-Domingue, formed in what later became known as Haiti. The regiment was formed of both free and enslaved black men. The latter were promised to freedom in return from military service. Uh, their first action was the siege of British-held Savannah, Georgia, in autumn 1779, and the unit was disbanded in 1783. Uh, all three regiments, uh, the French regiment, um, the uh, Ethiopian Volunteer, e Ethiopian regiment, and the Black First, First Rhode Island regiment uh, had black private soldiers with white command staff. So now let's get back to the Continental Army. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When those words were written for the Declaration of Independence, Africans had been enslaved in British North America for almost 160 years, and African Americans had been fighting 14 months for the cause of American independence in the Continental Army and states militia. Not for another 89 years would slavery in the United States be legally ended. At the onset of the War for Independence, approximately 500,000 African Americans lived in the colonies, of, some, of whom some 450,000 were enslaved. Blacks fought in provincial regiments prior to the war and roughly 5,000 African American soldiers and sailors, free and slaves, served the revolutionary cause. While accurate numbers are hard to come by, the American population at the time was approximately some 2.1 million. Using those accepted estimates, free blacks comprised 2.4% of the population and slaves uh, formed 21.5%. Um, keep those percentages in mind as we continue. We'll get to, get to those a little bit later. And before we go into an, into an overview of early service, let's discuss black soldiers' motivation for joining the Continental Army. Um, the reasons were many and varied. Uh, I mean, they were human beings after all. Uh, and most of the reasons mirrored those of their fellow white and Indian soldiers. They included the adventure of military service, sometimes connected with the prospects of uh, serving alongside family or friends. Um, the lore of an enlisted bounty or regular pay and fighting for national independence and hope for opportunities in the new country. Forced service was another factor. If they were on the militia soul, uh, roles, um, both white and black men were periodically drafted for short-term stint in a continental, in a continental regiment. Uh, so there was conscription during the war. Whites were occasionally compelled to enlist, but enslaved African Americans were more often coerced or forced to uh, serve by their masters. Some were promised freedom in return. Uh, most were freed after being discharged, but a few were kept in bondage. Um, it pretty much was the exception to the rule that uh, most were freed if they were promised freedom. Um, of course, the major dividing line between white and black common soldiers was skin color and the American system of enslaving Africans and African Americans. So now for an overview of, of early service. Um, black Americans were in the fight from the first. Massachusetts militiamen of color, free and enslaved, fought alongside their white comrades in, on April 19, 1775. Today, we have the names of 35 black men present that day, at least 18 seeing combat. One, Prince Estabrook was wounded with Captain John Parker's company on Lexington Green. 
Given incomplete records, it's likely that as many as 40 to 50 African Americans were with the militia on the war's first day. Two months later, at least 88 black and 15 Indian soldiers were, uh, were known to uh, have served at the Battle of Bunker Hill. One historian, George Quintal, uh, estimated the total might be as high as 150, roughly 5% of the American troops involved. Um, again, remember that percentage, 5% of, of the American troops at, uh, at Bunker Hill. There are several mentions of black participation in those early actions, but this is my favorite. Speaking to, courage, to the courage and resilience of African-American soldiers and the effect one man's determination had on another. Uh, white Massachusetts soldier John Greenwood noted of that day at Bunker Hill, everywhere the greatest terror and conf confusion seemed to prevail. As they ran along the road leading to Bunker Hill, it was filled with, with chairs and wagons bearing the wounded and dead. Never having beheld such a fight sight before, I felt very much frightened. I could positively feel my hair stand on end. Just as they came near the place, a Negro man wounded in the back of his neck passed me, and his collar being open, and he not having anything on except his shirt and trousers, I saw the wound quite plainly and the blood running down his back. I asked him if it hurt. I asked him if it if it hurt him much, and he said no, that he was only going to get a plaster put on it and meant to return. You cannot conceive what encouragement this immediately, this immediately gave me. I began to feel brave and like a soldier from that moment, and fear never troubled me afterward during the whole war. Despite their proven ability, African Americans were early on deemed unfit for military service. A May 1775 Massachusetts provincial resolution stated that no slaves be admitted into this army upon what, any, any consideration whatever. So that spoke to slaves only. By contrast, in October 1775, uh, Council of Officers agreed unanimous, unanimously to reject all slaves and by a great majority to reject Negroes altogether. On November 12, Army orders directed neither Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, nor old men unfit to endure the fatigues of the campaign are to be enlisted. Signaling a change of policy at the end of December, General George Washington told of numbers of free Negroes who were desirous of enlisting, giving leave to the recruiting officers to en entertain them. Now, given that desperate need to fill kind of arrangements, uh, the policy was soon amended to include all free blacks in the American army began as and remained a racially integrated organization to the war's end. But despite the inclusion and acceptance of African Americans in the ranks and little to no indication of animus from white soldiers, black continentals were generally allowed only to, to, serve, only to serve as musicians or privates and at least in the early war years, may have been channeled into such roles as waiter or laborer more often than their white comrades. That said, black musket bearing soldiers fought in every major battle of the war and in most, if not all, of the, of the lesser actions. Now, a number of American officers uh, and others have noted the fact of African Americans in the ranks, uh, some unfavorably with the claim they were unsuited to be soldiers, uh, but we'll focus mostly on the positive. In response to John Adams' October 1775 question about black soldiers in the Massachusetts regiments, um, Adams called them unsuitable for service. General William Heath replied, there are in the Massachusetts regiments some few lads and old men and in several regiments some Negroes, such is also the case with a number of, with the regiments from the other colonies. Rhode Island has a number of Negroes and Indians. Connecticut has fewer Negroes but a number of Indians. The New Hampshire regiments have less of both. The men from Connecticut, I think, are in general are stouter, are rather stouter than those of either the, of their other colonies. But the troops of our colony, Massachusetts, <clears throat> are robust, agile, and as fine fellows in general as they would ever wish to see in the field. Now, General John Thomas was more emphatic. In the regiments at Roxbury, the privates are equal to any that I served with last war. Very few old men and in the ranks very few boys. We have some Negroes, but I look on them in gen general equally serviceable with the other men. For fatigue and in action, many of them have proved themselves brave. <clears throat> Foreign officers were also compliment complimentary. In December 1777, a German officer wrote of the American Revolutionary Forces, the Negro can take the field in his master's place. Hence, you never see a regiment in which there are not a lot of Negroes, and there are well-built, strong, husky fellows among them. And Baron Ludwig von Klosen, aide-de-camp to French General Rochambeau, wrote in July 1781. And this passage is remarkable not just for what it says about the inclusion of blacks, but also just the condition of the army. He wrote, I had a chance to see the American army man for man. It is really painful to see those brave men almost naked with only some trousers and little linen jackets. Most of them without stockings, and would you believe it, very cheerful and healthy in appearance. It is incredible that soldiers composed of men of every age, even children of 15, of whites and blacks, unpaid and rather poorly fed, can march so fast and withstand fire so steadfastly. As for numbers, close and claimed, 
A quarter of Washington's army were Negroes, Murray, confident, and sturdy. Now for Closen's estimate of 25% of the army being African-Americans in 1781, I think that's an over uh, estimate. Um, I think that the proportion, the proportion did increase as the war went on, but I think by 1781, uh, probably eight to 10 percent of the army were African Americans. Um, and in that uh, context, uh, we'll get into uh, numbers now. Um, this is the only return of Africa or general return uh, for the army of African Americans uh, for the war. Um, in August 1778, a tally, tally was made of the number of black soldiers in 15 brigades of General George Washington's main army. There were 700, 755 African Americans in a force totaling almost 18,000 rank and file. Um, that means sergeants, corporals, music, and private soldiers, uh, making African Americans 4.2% of the whole. Now, while that proportion seems rather small, by, by themselves, soldiers of color would form two understrength regiments, each equal to, that's if they were all, all put together, um, each equal to or larger in size than most other serving continental regiments. And additionally, let's recall that free blacks form 2.4% of the overall American population. Even considering the numbers of, numbers of slaves who served, free African Americans were well rep represented as regards military service. New Jersey and Rhode Island are the only states not represented in, the, in return that had units serving with Washington's, Washington's army. Um, the number of blacks serving in New Jersey's four continental regiments is uncertain, but likely, uh, from my experience, no more than 20 during the entire war. Rhode Island had just reconstituted one of its regiments, the first filling it with African-American and Indian, Indian private soldiers, mostly former slaves. In August 1778, the, that unit contained 146 privates. Adding those men would bring an approximate total of African-American soldiers that month to about 916. Now, Using those numbers, we can uh, look at the percentage in, in, in each brigade. Um, so here are the six highest brigades. Uh, you can see there are, there are three from the north, three from the south. Uh, so African-American service was spread pretty evenly north and south. Uh, the, the three highest were Parsons, Connecticut, Muhlensburg, Virginia, and uh, the North Carolina Brigade with 9.3% uh, rank and file, 8.5 and 6.5%. So that's, that's much larger than the, the 15 brigade uh, overall uh, percentage of 4.2. And playing around again a little bit more, um, we can see that uh, we can calculate the average number of black soldiers per regiment within each brigade. Um, Parsons, Connecticut had 37 black soldiers per regiment. And that's Now that's eight companies in each regiment. Um, some companies did have nine companies, or some, some regiments had nine companies, most, most of them had eight. So those 37 black soldiers were likely spread through all the companies. Um, North Carolina had 29 black soldiers per, per regiment and uh, Patterson, Massachusetts, 22.25. Now, I love artwork um, and black soldiers unfortunately have not been uh, represented as well in especially modern artwork, but even period artwork um, of uh, regiments of the revolution. So here we have a, a painting from the Museum of the American Revolution which actually rectifies that a bit. You can see two black soldiers in the front rank and there may be some in the back rank, but we don't know. Um, it's, a, it's an image of, the, of a single company of Henley's additional regiment in 1779. And it's a good representation of how many uh, continental companies would have appeared with some, have some companies having a few more black soldiers and others none at all. Um, and this is based on an actual company return. As can be seen, the proportion of African-American soldiers may be considered rather small, but that's not as important as the mere presence in mixed regiments. One reason is the equation of military service with citizenship, a concept that continued into the mid 19th century. More importantly, foreign observers and others likely considered African-Americans serving alongside white soldiers as a radical revolutionary statement, almost on a par with the Declaration of Independence and taking up arms against the king. It may have been an unintentional and to some unwelcome political statement, but it was just as powerful as the purposeful and just as pragmatic arming of blacks during the 1860s American Civil War. So now we'll get into a few stories. Um, I wanna turn, into, uh, turn to uh, three soldiers, one each from New Jersey, Connecticut, and Virginia. Um, and these stories come from, the, from those veterans 19th century pension uh, narratives, uh, which historian John C. Dan called one of the largest oral history projects ever undertaken. 
Jacob Francis was born in New Jersey and eventually served in the Massachusetts Continental Regiment for one year, and then in the New Jersey militia from 1777 to the war's end. Francis was born in January 1754 and testified, when I was of age, I was bound as an indentured servant, not a slave, but an indentured servant, by my mother, a card woman, to one Henry Wambau in Amwell. That's Amwell, New Jersey. His indenture was sold to three other masters the last time at a little over 13 years of age to Joseph Saxon, who took him to New York, then to an island in the Caribbean, then back to Salem, Massachusetts, where he was sold one more time. In January 1775, his indenture ended, having served his last master for, according to Francis, six years and until I was 21 years of age. Still living in Salem, Francis enlisted in autumn 1775 for one year in Sergeant's 16th Massachusetts Continental Regiment. Uh, during that term, he served in the Boston Siege and witnessed the battles of Long Island and White Plains. A short time after the fall of Fort Lee on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River, Francis and his comrades marched across New Jersey, crossed into the river into Pennsylvania, and then marched down to a camp off from the Delaware River, a few miles below Corios Ferry and above House Ferry, where we lay there a week or two. So that's actually uh, part of the uh, current Washington's Crossing State Park, uh, Pennsylvania, where he camped. In his pension application, Jacob. Uh, described the 26th December 1776 attack on the Hessians at Trenton, New Jersey. Um, and he describes it rather accurately. We received orders to march on Christmas night, crossed at the Delaware River, down to Trenton early in the morning, entered the west end of the town. General Washington came into the north end of the town. We marched down the street from the river road into the town to the corner where it crosses the street running out towards the Scotch Road and turned up that street. General Washington was at the head of that street coming down towards us and some of the Hessians were between us. There we had the fight and the principal firing was. After about half an hour, the firing ceased. General Lord Sterling rode up to Colonel Sargent and conversed with him. We were ordered to follow him down through the town towards Aston King Creek and onto the north side of it. There we were formed in line in view of the Hessians who were paraded on the south side. Being hemmed in, the Hessians surrendered, grounded their arms and left them there and marched down to the old ferry below the Aston Pink between Trenton and Lumberton, where they were ferried across to the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware. Private Francis soon ended his Continental Army career being discharged at Trenton soon after the battle. The remainder of his lengthy deposition, and it's a wonderful deposition if you ever get a chance to read it, it's actually published in uh, John C. Dan's book, um, The Revolution Remembered. Uh, it recounts his um, militia career, and uh, it is too long to recount here, but um, he did state, I always went out when it came to my turn to the end of the war, and went out once as a substitute for a person who could not and gave me $45 continental money to take his place. Now a side note, in 1789, Jacob Francis struck another small blow for freedom. Former slave Phyllis Duncan testified, and this is in the pension papers, she testified she was present and saw Mary Francis married to Jacob Francis by Cato Finley. At the time of said marriage, Phyllis and Mary Francis and Cato Finley all lived with and were the slaves of Nathaniel Hunt where the marriage took place. Jacob Francis immediately after his marriage to Mary, Mary bought Mary from her master, Nathaniel Hunt. Mary in a few days left the employ of Hunt and went with her husband and have ever since that time lived together as man and wife up until the death of Jacob and raised a family of children. Now let's turn to uh, ben Benaji Abro um, of Connecticut. He first signed on in 1776 uh, for a one-year enlistment in Burroughs, Connecticut State Regiment. Uh, he joined uh, and marched to Can Canada within about 45 or 40 miles of Quebec to a place called the Three Rivers, and from there retreated before the enemy to Crown Point and Ticonderoga and Mount Independence until he was discharged in the month of November on account of his having been sick. Um, he continued his testimony. In the month of March 1778, he again listed at New Hartford for during the war and joined the company commanded by Captain Andrew Fitch in the 4th Regiment, commanded by Colonel John Durkee. He joined the company and regiment with the recruiting officer, officer at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. At the Monmouth Battle in New Jersey, he was wounded and taken to the hospital, and after that joined the Army at the White Plains and had winter quarters at Reading in Connecticut. He continued and served in, in the Army to the close of the war. Now, two of his officers give virtually identical accounts, but with a few more details. And again, these are in the pension papers. In 1817, his uh, former captain, Lemuel Clift, recalled, at the Battle of Monmouth, Benjamin Abro was a black soldier in the company under my command. During the action, while the American troops were retreating, Abro was wounded in the neck by a musket ball from the enemy. I th and I then supposed the wound to be mortal, and he was left on the ground. And I then supposed the wound to be mortal 
we after afterwards occupied the same ground on which Abro was shot and found him alive and he was sent to the hospital and recovered. Another captain in the regiment um, added that after his hospital stay, Abro joined his company and regiment and was able to do his duty tolerably well, though, as understandably, he always complained of his neck being stiff. And finally, a Virginia soldier. Um, of all the black Virginia Continentals I found for my study, uh, Andrew Pebbles had perhaps the most varied career. In his pension testimony, he noted that he didn't recall the year he enlisted being a poor unlearned mulatto, but according to his military records, it was September 15, 1777. He testified that if he joined the camp at Valley Forge and was placed under the command of Captain Lewis Booker, 11th Virginia Regiment, for two years. Um, now, he, he talks about his service, and it, and it, it was very calm for, common for Continental soldiers to be drafted or taken out of their regiments to serve with the artillery. So he notes that he served one year in the artillery. Uh, for the part of the year, he was under Captain William Miller, who commanded the gun with 12 men to which he belonged. He served for two years under Captain Michael Rudolph of Maryland in the light infantry commanded by Colonel Harry Lee. Um, Harry Lee is also Light Horse Harry Lee, uh, also known as Henry Lee. Uh, he was the father of Robert E. Lee. Um, his command was com composed of infantry and cavalry, uh, known as Lee's Legion. Uh, he was in three general actions at Monmouth, uh, the Battle of Monmouth, Guilford Courthouse, and at Utah Springs. At Utah Springs, um, and again, this is still his testimony, uh, he received three, three wounds. He was wounded in the shoulder slightly, slightly, lost the thumb of his left hand, and was bayoneted in the belly. He was discharged on the Combahee River honorably. The day before he was discharged, he was in a battle in which Colonel John Lawrence, who commanded in the absence of Colonel Lee, was killed, 27 August, 1782. Anybody who's, who's seen the, uh, the, music, uh, the, the play Hamilton, the musical Hamilton, uh, would uh, know the character of John Lawrence, and that's the same John Lawrence as, as, uh, as is uh, pictured in the, uh, in the musical. Um, again, a side note, uh, Peebles too, though a free man, had to deal with the issue of slavery post-war. Um, and in his pension, te pension he testified, uh, by occupation, I am a miller from the infirmity of the old age increased by the wounds received in the Revolutionary War. I'm not able to render my service to my employer. I'm a free mulatto. My wife and child who live at the mill where I do are slaves. My wife's name is Rachel, and between 15 and 60 years, my child's name is Ursula. So here we have pictured um, two other men, uh, Thomas Mahorny, formerly of the 2nd Virginia Regiment, who also testified that uh, um, he is unassisted by the labor, laborer's family uh, because his wife and his son, Jack, are, uh, are both slaves. And Drury Scott, uh, formerly of the 10th Virginia Regiment, um, said that he, he can get but little, little, little work, but he can get no assistance from his, fa from his family, uh, again, because they are all slaves. Now the unit most associated um, with African American revolutionary soldiers is the so-called Black First, Ro First Rhode Island Regiment. In reality, it existed as such only from March 1778 to June 1780, uh, two years and three months. It never was large enough to form a full regiment and because of that never served with Washington's main army until after the unit joined the second Rhode Island in 1781 when they were cons consolidated to form uh, a single Rhode Island Regiment. Now, while a detailed discussion would take too much time, I want to discuss several aspects of the regiment. Uh, General William Heath's 1775 letter noted, the regiments of Rhode Island have a number of Negroes and Indians. All the Rhode Island regiments from 1775 through 1777 contain black soldiers serving alongside their white comrades. While with the Continental Army, Army's 1777 rebirth, only the first and second Rhode Island regiments remained recruited with men enlisted or re-enlisted for three years or during the duration of the war. So you can see that in 1777, uh, in August, in October 1777, the proportion of, uh, of African-American soldiers in those two regiments was 16.5%, which is uh, almost twice as much as the highest brigade percentage uh, in the 1778 return. So the Rhode Island regiments um, as a whole had, had a, a large number of black soldiers throughout the war. Now, the Rhode Island regiments were particularly hard hit during the 1777 campaign. The state had to consider how to recruit them. James Varnum, uh, who was now brigade commander, he was formerly a colonel, recommended in January 1778 uh, that a battalion of Negroes be raised in Rhode Island. 
that that February, the state legislature resolved that any Negro, mulatto, or Indian man slave, and yes, they did have Indian slaves in Rhode Island and several other states, uh, states too, uh, in Rhode Island could enlist in either of the two battalions to serve during the continuance of the war. Um, it was either, it was eventually decided that the recruits would join only the first Rhode Island regiment. So as of February 1778 and March 1778, the first Rhode Island regiment uh, became a segregated regiment with, with only black privates, no white privates. Um, and it did have uh, a white command staff. Governor, General, or Governor Nicholas Cook noted in late February uh, 1778, the number of slaves in the state is not great, but is generally thought that 300 and upwards will be enlisted. Any slaves accepted, received their freedom and their owners were, uh, were given uh, recompense. Unpopular with many residents in early May, the legislature set a June 10, 1778 cutoff date for slave recruiting, though free blast continuing to enlist. So they only, re only recruited uh, um, free slaves from June, from February 1778 to June and, and then cut off cut off the time when they could accept uh, uh, slaves into the regiment. Despite Governor Cook's assurances that best less than 150 African Americans um, ever joined the 1st Regiment, it was never able to full, form a full battalion for service with Washington's main army. Now, while the first, while the first Rhode Island uh, command staff was recruiting slaves in their home state, the regiment's enlisted personnel um, remaining at Valley Forge were incorporated into the 2nd Regiment. At the same time, the veteran black soldiers from both regiments were formed into a single, single segregated company under Captain Thomas Arnold. Now that regiment basically nom nominally belonged to the 1st Regiment, but since the 1st Regiment was, was still in Rhode Island, it served alongside the 2nd Regiment, uh, still back in Valley Forge, still back in Pennsylvania. Um, Arnold's large company by spring 1778 uh, consisted of 60, 60 privates, uh, all black. Belong, um, again, fielded with uh, Colonel Israel Angle's 2nd uh, Rhode Island. When Washington's forces confronted the British, confronted the British at uh, June 28, 1778 Battle of Monmouth, uh, Arnold's Black Company marched to Monmouth Courthouse with Varner's Brigade and Major General Lee's, Charles Lee's advance force. So this is a little, a little known incident where there was, there was a, an, actually an all, an all Black Company fighting at the Battle of Monmouth. And this, so this, this was before that the, that the entire Black, uh, Black First Rhode Island Regiment got into action at, um, at the Battle of Rhode Island in August 1778. Early in the action, Lee's men retreated in the face of superior forces, withdrawing towards Washington's marching troops. Meeting in the main army's van, General Lee encountered Washington, who placed Lee in charge of an ad hoc holding action. Uh, a Rhode Island, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island Lieutenant Colonel described the, the defense. Um, and where this took place, uh, you can still go, go to the, to the battle, uh, battlefield of Monmouth, uh, Monmouth Battlefield State Park, and see where the hedgerow is, um, and actually stand where this action took, took place. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel only uh, stated, after retiring something more than a mile under Major General Lee, General Varnum's brigade was ordered to halt and formed by a cross fence, cross fence to cover two pieces of artillery, which were in danger of being lost. We were there exchanged, we there exchanged about 10, 10, 10 rounds. Now, if you go to that site, you can actually see the site where the artillery was positioned. It's, act, it's actually a mound be, be behind the uh, main defense line. Uh, only continues. We there continue, exchanged about 10 rounds and were then obliged to retire with considerable loss, but not until the enemy had outflanked us and advanced with charge bayonets to the fence by which we had formed. Our brigade suffered more than any that was engaged. The loss in our regiment was Lieutenant Wicks, a sergeant and eight privates killed, Captain Thomas Arnold of the Black Company and seven privates wounded and four privates missing. The enemy did not pursue us far in our retreat, observing our army formed on the heights in our rear. Now Arnold's leg was amputated as a result of his wounded battle of Monmouth. Um, and one of Arnold's men, uh, Richard Rhodes, related in the 19th century, he is very much crippled in one arm in consequence of a wound received in the Battle of Monmouth. He went on to say, he was born in Africa, brought to this country and sold as a slave and enlisted in the Black Regiment to obtain his freedom. Arnold's company joined the First Rhode Island in, seven, in July 1778. Uh, the so-called Black Regiment went on to see combat uh, in August at the Battle of Rhode Island and remained in their home state until marching into New York to be consolidated with the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment in, uh, in early 1781. Now, before I continue, I want to briefly discuss the treatment of African American soldiers. Um, regarding equal treatment at the most, most basic level, continental soldiers of color, both African and Native Americans, received the same pay, provisions, clothing, and equipment as white soldiers. 
Now, if anybody's familiar with the United States Colored Regiments of the American Civil War, that was not the case, at least as far as pay. Um, black soldiers during the, during the Civil War uh, in, the, in the Federal Army were, uh, were paid less, and that was a big bone of contention. Not so during the Revolution. Um, they suffered together in times of scarcity and jointly enjoyed the rare times of bounty. Now, were there difficulties due to officers or fellow soldiers' personal or racial anim race animus? Most surely, but to my knowledge, such instances were few and far between. I found almost no, no instances uh, in my research. One incident is telling. A White Rhode Island uh, soldier, Abner Simmons, recalled in 1780 when the two remaining black companies were joined with an understrength and integrated Rhode Island six months levy regiment. Captain Elijah Lewis commanded the black company, which was actually two companies, which took put, post on the, on the right of the Rhode Island six, six months levy regiment. The right of, reg, the, right of the regiment um, by 18th century military usage was the place of honor. And in this case, uh, the place of honor was accorded uh, two segregated uh, black companies, uh, something you would not see in the uh, 19th or the 20th centuries in the American army. Now, before we move on, um, a bit more about this unit. Uh, the segregated first, first Rhode Island Regiment was an outlier, an experiment born of necessity in, in an army of integrated units. Um, the experiment was largely unsuccessful, but through no fault of its own. The fact that the regiment remained seriously under strength for the entire term of existence, of existence was largely due to the legislature cutting off slave enlistment only four months after it was begun. Still, in the 19th century, the Black Regiment became a symbol, an example, an example of African-American abil ability as soldiers, and was seen by many as a precursor to the United States Colored Regiments that were formed during the American Civil War. So while we've seen how slavery could affect, affect free blacks after the war, let's see how even serving soldiers was not immune to that threat. A late war soldier civilian confrontation emphasizes the par perils black soldiers were exposed to even from their fellow revolutionaries. Um, Private Fortune Stoddard began his military career with the integrated, uh, and that's actually uh, uh, on the left of this picture is a, a picture of, a, of the um, soldier of the first, first Rhode Island Regiment in 1781, one of the black companies. Uh, Private Fortune Stoddard began his military career with the integrated Rhode Island 1786 months state battalion. Re enlisting in the 1781 Rhode Island Regiment that December after the Yorktown siege, he and a number of other Rhode Island soldiers were quartered on the first floor of a home at Head of Elk, Maryland. Now this, the, what followed is based on uh, two affidavits that were, uh, that were um, given by soldiers, uh, that uh, were soldier witnesses. Upstairs in the home, a group of seamen were celebrating, inebriated their Captain James Cunningham, descended to the first floor and commenced abusing the soldiers, particularly Stoddard, who he assaulted with his fists in a small round chair. Private Stoddard called on the captain to cease. At that point, Connecticut Captain Ebenezer Wales entered and confronted Cunningham, who in turn threatened Wales, who then had the seaman ousted at the point of the bayonet. Cunningham and his men returned the next day and demanded alcohol from the, from the homeowner, which he refused. The sound of breaking furniture drew two unarmed, unarmed Rhode Islanders down upstairs. One was knocked to the floor and Benjamin Blanchard, a white private, retreated downstairs. So here we can see that both white and black privates were, were, uh, were stationed in the same house. When the seamen followed him down, the rest of the soldiers were ready with loaded muskets and fixed bayonets. One white private aimed at Captain Cunningham's face, but a seaman seized the weapon from the soldier upon which the captain grabbed it and struck the soldier's head. At this, Private Stoddard fired, hitting Cunningham in the, in the groin, a wound that proved mortal. Fortune Stoddard was arrested and tried for murder in a Cecil County, Maryland civil court. He was eventually convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to be branded, spe specifically burnt in the brawn of the left thumb with a hot iron. That being done, Stoddard was still required to pay court costs, but not having the funds to do so, he remained confined. Finally, the county government settled on the solution that he'd be sold into slavery to pay his debt. Fortunately, the Rhode Island commander brought the case to General Washington's attention and eight months, eight months after the incident, all which time uh, Stoddard was in prison, the Continental Congress decided that the state of Maryland be requested to discharge from confinement Fortune Stoddard, a soldier belonging to the Rhode Island Regiment. He was confined for costs accrued in a late prosecution and, char and, and the Maryland government should charge such costs to the United States in order that the same pay, same may be charged to the said soldier and deducted out of his pay. 
Fortune Stoddard never reappeared on this regiment's muster roll. So as far as we know, he was confined to the war's end. Um, he did eventually return to Rhode Island and lived in Newport, where he married, raised a family, and by 1805 was, was working as a chimney sweep. Now, that Stoddard's murder charge resulted in a manslaughter conviction that did not require confinement speaks to some fairness in the jury's deliberations, um, despite the, zen, the, the then common, but well, to us, barbaric sentence, sentence of branding. Um, there was a similar case in 1780 where pretty much an ex exactly similar case um, where a Rhode Island soldier was on guard duty, uh, killed a, uh, fired and killed a, a white uh, civilian at nighttime, uh, was charged with manslaughter, or charged with, uh, with murder, uh, convicted of manslaughter, and basically was sent and received, received the exact same sentence. It's just in that case, uh, the man was able to pay his court costs, um, whereas Stoddard uh, couldn't. So that, that man was released and returned to his regiment. Now, the most telling and horrifying result of the trial is that the Cecil County government's suggestion that Fortune Stoddard be sold into slavery to pay the oak court costs. Beyond any other opinions in the matter, no white soldier could be subjected to the same, quote, solution, unquote. Now, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, women with the army. Um, especially African-American women who, by their own free will or the will of others, served with the army. Uh, to correct the, correct the popular idea of army women, black and white, they were by and large respectable and respected. Any woman, women who were not were not long tolerated. I've discovered another number of black women with the army, some of them servants. One of those was Hannah Till, who served in General Washington's household and gave birth to a son at Valley Forge. Another was Rachel, and you can see a, a, a picture that a, a friend of mine did of, uh, of the runaway, dis based on the runaway dis uh, description of Rachel. Um, Rachel, who previously called herself Sarah, uh, she was a slave who stole herself and joined the 1st Maryland Regiment in 1778. But I want to focus on one woman, uh, Judith Lines, and read a portion of the only known surviving letter written home by a black soldier during the war, published for the first time in my book, They Were Good Soldiers. To preface the letter, John Lines enlisted in the 5th Connecticut Regiment in March 1781 for three years. Part of his time was spent at West Point and other Hudson Highland posts. By Judith Lyon's own testimony, testimony, again in the pension papers, they married in 1780. She recalled the next summer after I married, he sent for me to come to him. I think the place was called the Highlands. At that time, my husband was a waiter for Colonel Sherman. And while at the camp, I had the smallpox. I think I stayed about three or four months. Mrs. Lyons noted in the pension application, my husband used to write to me that he was in the army and I have one of his letters now and which I give to the magist magistrate who takes this my deposition and is dated November 11, 1781 and is, a is in the handwriting of my husband. So now the letter. I take this opportunity to, to send you my dear and loving wife to let you know that I'm well and hoping these lines may find you and the children well. This is the sixth letter of mine and I haven't received one. I belong to Colonel Sherman's regiment. We lay at Fishkill now. I should be very glad if you would send me a letter how you have done this summer and whether, whether the house is done and whether you have killed that cow or whether you have got him another. I want to know all these things very much. I intend to come home this winter if I can, but I don't know if I can. If I could see you myself then I could talk with you, my dear wife, as I like. I have seen hard times. I have lived 11 days with bread, white, with bread only. I remain your loving husband until death, John Lines. So from this, you can see several things. First, Judith Lines was a, was a woman of the army for, for at least several months. She, she contracted smallpox in the army, and that's no easy disease to recover from, uh, so, but she did recover. Um, also, while her husband was in service, she was at home taking care of, of, the, of the homestead, taking care of the animals and anything else that needed to be, needed to be uh, dealt with. Um, so it says a lot for the for for her and and, and other women who, that, who served with the army and, but also were left on the home front uh, caring for um, caring for things on their own. So lines and other veterans returned home to a changed and changing nation. Uh, despite the waning of northern slavery, um, with the ratification of the 1789 United States Constitution and boosted by the 1794 Cotton Gin Patent, 
black bondage was cemented as a political and economic fact and de detrimental racial attitudes hardened before, but more especially after 1800. 35 years after the war, black revolutionary veterans along with their white comrades were el eligible for service, uh, for service pensions. But even in that system, they experienced the effect of, of increasing bias. Um, not all blacks ex experienced bias uh, when it came to pensions, but, but the pensions were administered state by state. So it depended on who you had to deal with in each state. When all was said and done, African-American military service was a direct challenge to slavery and the racial construct and an affront to many white citizens. Still, black Americans continued to write, fight for the nation as 81-year-old Judith Lyons related in 1837. My youngest son died of a wound received in the last war, the War of 1812. His name was Benjamin. The wound was received at the Battle of Chippewa, July 5th, 1814. And just to preface this next, next piece, when they applied for pensions, after the first pension act, the, the ensuing acts required that pension that veterans um, show that they that, that they were in need, and in other words, they that they needed the, the money that, that that their pension would give them. Um, so they were they they had to uh, to basically make up a list of all their belongings, which were then then valued and totaled. Um, Black revolutionary vet veterans remained proud of their service is attested by Artillo Freeman, who in the tally of his belongings, which was totaled, totaled uh, in its entirety as $15.75. At the end of the list, he added one more item, revolutionary uniform, invaluable. In closing, former private Henry Hall Hallowell, a white private of Colonel Rufus Putnam's 5th Massachusetts Regiment gave this simple but fitting tribute to the African-Americans free enslaved free and enslaved who served the revolutionary cause in a number of roles. And Hallowell was writing in the 19th century. He wrote, in my company, there was four Negroes named Jephthah Ward, Job Upton, Douglas Middleton, and Pomp Sim Simmons. Part of them called on me after their time was out. They were good soldiers. Now that closes my presentation. Um, I do wanna let you know that um, there is, I do have more information online. Uh, it, it's, there's information on uh, black soldiers with the Hessian regiments. It's a, um, I can't remember who, uh, who wrote that article, but there's another article by Todd Braestead on, Braestead on uh, 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 black, uh, black serving in loyalist uh, regiments. Um, and there's a number of other, other articles, uh, including, including links to a blog, which I've uh, started to add additional information to the subject. Um, that said, I really want to thank you for uh, taking your time out from the day and, and uh, attending um, my talk. And I'll turn this back over to uh, Kim. Well, thank you. Let me uh, hold on here. There we go. There you are. <laughs> there you are. I did, did, hold did, on. Let did, me did, do. Did, did, did the images come up, come up okay? Did the images come up okay? Um, they were up. I think some people would have um, liked if they had if the slides had been on the on the whole screen. But yeah, I, you know, I, I we, we I, saw I them. See, I mean, I, I couldn't see how to do it, and I, <laughs> you know, I I completely relate. As I've been uh, I told everybody, I, I'm a little hamstrung myself when it comes to technology. <laughs> so I, I think we're all. Um, just sort of going with the flow with that. <laughs> um, but thank you. Your, your talk was very informative. And oh, we do have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, the first is, um, involves the name of two particular soldiers of color, one named, and forgive me if my pronunciation is incorrect, uh, Juba, J-U-B-A, Smith. Uh, the other is Prince Ingraham of Bristol, Rhode Island. Did you mm -hmm. come across them in your in your research? No, but I, I had the I had the con the conundrum of when it, when I was trying to figure out how to do my book, I I I couldn't speak about everyone. You know, everyone who served. Um, so I, I I basically basically uh, looked at the at those who left pensions and I, and I did have other accounts besides the pensions, but I but I, I I had to narrow it down to a few soldiers. But I'm I'm always interested in in other other accounts of of, uh, of African American soldiers during the war. Um, but no, unfortunately, I, I I didn't I didn't write, didn't use them in the research for my book. Um, but which like again, which is not to say that I'm, I'm I'm not interested in them because I'm I'm still doing research and so I'm still writing about the subject. All right. 
right, well, just to, to show our, our uh, participants, again, this is the book, and you, I don't know how well you can see on here, but you, you break down the chapters by state or by colony. <laughs> well, and, states, states have it as of 1777, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll go with either one. Uh, so there's really good information in here. And some of, uh, we've got a couple of questions regarding your process. Um, specifically, how do you start? If somebody wants, to, has a, uh, someone specific they'd like to look up, uh, maybe somebody in their family or somebody from their hometown. Uh, are there resources available online that you can recommend or wh where do you start once you have the question? What, well, the, what nice step two? the nice thing is if you have a name and you know where they served, the first, the first stop is, is do a, a Google search, a Bing search, whatever kind of search you want to do because there's, there's an amazing amount of, um, of material online now be, between the between the genealogy sites where it was put, put a lot of stuff online um, so you might get a hit uh, you just put you know a name um, revolutionary you could put African American revolutionary soldier and just and just go with that and just do a search um, the the great that now for the for the pension applications um, I mean, I, I have a printed index here, so I can I can look in that index to see who see who that has has pensions. But you, they they are online at a at a it's a pay site. It's called Fold Three, um, and all the pensions are online, and, and you can search for names there. Uh, I forget what it's. I think it costs about seventy dollars a year. I'm not sure. Uh, there is also a genealogy site that um, uh, the genealogy site that. Uh, I can't, it's either Ancestry or Heritage, I can't remember, but they, they, they have uh, the pension applications there too. They're not in their entirety, but they're, but they're pretty useful. And then yeah, there's yeah. also a, uh, it's in my book and I, it's, I think it's called Patriots of Color. The, the editor is Eric Grunset. It's, it's put out by the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. It's online. You can, you can find, find online. Um, I think if you put in like Eric Grunset and Patriots of Color, um, you can get a PDF copy of it and you can search that it's, it's by state, but you can, you can search that and you can, uh, by names. I, I would, I use that, uh, in my research because they also list those who have pensions. It's not perfect because I found soldiers, uh, that, that they say have pensions. Um, but, or they did, they, they don't have, have them as having pensions, but they did receive pensions. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it, but it's a great resource. Um, and then again, if you, if we go online and like put in Connecticut African American soldiers or Black soldiers, some of the states put out uh, put out books or or other authors put out books on on this Black soldiers from each state. So you, you might look out there too. All right, and I see in our chat, um, and I, I copied and sent the the link available to everyone in the group chat here um, oh. for a book called Forgotten Patriots. So uh, is, that, is, that the, is that the one? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's something that people can look at. Uh, a question about the pension. Could a widow get her husband's pension after he passed away? Yes, yes. And that's, that's, why, that's why you get women like Judith Lines um, giving her, de her, her deposition for the pension. So they could be applied for later if, um, if the veteran never got a pension a widow could apply for his pension or or if he did get a pension she she could apply to continue it okay uh, and that's and that that was whether you know white, white black or indian it didn't matter that's the the nice the interesting thing about the revolutionary era it was not a perfect time it really was not a perfect time but um but there were revolutionary ideals which which a lot of people of the period pretty much try try to adhere to and african americans were treated Especially compared to the 19th and 20th centuries, they're they were competed, uh, treated, and I'm talking about free African Americans, of course, which were, were treated pretty fairly, um, which changed in the you know in, the, in uh, around 1900 and especially afterwards, and, and again onto the on the 20th 20th century. Um, so you know they, they so they, they did yeah they they they, they were eligible yes. Uh, toward the end, when you were talking about women, we have a question here. There was a woman named Rachel but we yes. missed her last name. Could you repeat that? She had no last name. She was, she oh, was a slave okay. or, or the, the ad did not give her last name. She was, she, uh, the ad basically says Sarah, who, uh, who now calls herself Rachel. So she changed okay. her name. 
um, she may have taken, if somebody would have pushed it, she may have, like so many slaves took their master's last name. Um, but all, the only thing we know about her is, is the mention in that, in that runaway ad. We also know that, that, her, that her son was fair haired. So, and she was a mulatto, so, it was, so they, were, they, were, they were mixed race. Um, okay. and, and, uh, but it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful description, and, and my friend uh, Bryant White did that illustration from the description. Um, so if, if we can finally uh, kind of see her. <laughs> uh, what is the highest rank that an African-American served in the revolution? There, well, on the Continental side, Continental Army, um, there may have been a, a black sergeant that served in the Virginia Continental Line. I haven't, I've, I found his records, um, and, but I, I haven't really verified, verified it yet because it, it may be that there was a white soldier of the same name, but I, I have a feeling that it, was, that it was the same man. I just have, haven't been able to find it. And if, if that's true, um, he was the only black sergeant that served in the Continental Army. There were, there were two, there were three corporals that served in the Rhode Island Regiment. And the reason they were promoted to corporal is because um, on, the, the Black Rhode Island Regiment only had white, white sergeant, sergeants and corporals. But at a certain point, they didn't have enough white soldiers to, the, to, be, to be corporals in the regiment. So they promoted three, three uh, blacks in the regiment to serve as corporals. Once, once they were consolidated with the, uh, with the second regiment, they were all put back down in the ranks. Um, but uh, so, so mostly African Americans in the Continental Army served as uh, as private soldiers or as musicians. Um, in the in the Loyalists, there there was one man, and it was not an official rank, but it's it's notable because his his title was Colonel Ty. He he led a he led, led an irregular band of loyal, Loyalists out of the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, um, and Colonel Ty again not not an official. You know, he, he wasn't awarded that rank, but he was uh, officially, but he was called Colonel Ty because he, he commanded uh, what was then called the Black Brigade, which was basically an integrated brigade, or a brigade of, of white and black loyalists. Um, and he commanded them for about a year and a half, maybe two years until he was killed in action. So that's the only, only, only other incident I know of, yeah, for... All right, we've got a few more. We can only do a few more. We've got a bunch of questions coming in, but let's see how many we can get through. Um, <laughs> <laughs> were the records for militia similar to continental pension records? Uh, somebody is, has an ancestor in the continental, but thinks they may have been in the militia before that. And I know that sometimes you have cases of soldiers who were in the militia, then in the continental, then back to the militia. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, the militia soldiers could get pensions too. And the, the neat thing about militia soldiers is because um, the the records for continental soldiers were were a, lo a lot easier then to access. Um, whereas the militia records, they they tried to collect all the all the state records for the continental soldiers in in one place in Washington. Um, didn't always happen, but they tried to do it. The militia records were were all were spread all around among the different states and and even among private collections. So some of those militia, if you find a militia soldier applying for a pension, uh, some of those are really great narratives because they, they want to talk as much about their service as they can to, to, um, to verify their service. Mm -hmm. Because you had to have, I think you have, had to have at least nine months service to, to get okay. a pension. Um, All right, here's another. Uh, were there any differences in the quality of weaponry that soldiers of color, uh, be they African-American or Native American, received versus what um, were being used by Caucasian soldiers? No, no, and, and, not, and not that I've, I mean, I haven't seen the, the arms returns for the Rhode Island Regiment, but um, I'm pretty sure the, the I'm pretty sure the, uh, the white commanders would not allow that to happen. But in the rest of the Continental Army, um, like I said, they, the white, black Indian soldiers received the same clothing, the same pay, the same equipment, um, the same everything. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> Give me a moment. Um, oh, we've got a couple of requests. Can you uh, say your, your URL again? People are interested. They want to go uh, 
They want to come well, visit I'll, your website. Well, what, 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 I, what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll, I'll actually give, I'll give you my, um, my email because I, my email is actually on that URL. Okay. And, uh, and my, my, my email is uh, ju underscore Reese, R-E-E-S at msn.com. And that's ju underscore R-E-E-S at msn.com. And, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll send you the, the, the link and, um, and uh, answer, any, answer any questions that you might have. All right, and if people didn't get that or they think of questions later, you can feel free to uh, contact, um, contact the park. Uh, our uh, email addresses are on the website and I can certainly pass along questions uh, to Mr. Rees. Uh, let's see, I have one more and then we will wrap it up. Uh, is there any compare or contrast of the African Americans of the Continental Army versus the fate of blacks in the French Ethiopian regiment in general? Um, the any any blacks who served who served in the in the uh, well you mean the any blacks who served in the French regiment uh, received their freedom just 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 like any any blacks who served in in the Rhode Island regiment the Black Rhode Island regiment. And the same thing for the uh, for the loyalist um, Ethiopian regiment, the uh, the Dunmore's regiment, seventeen seventy five. Basically, for for that regiment, the uh, Dunmore raided the coast, freeing slaves, and then any and basically taking them back to the British base. Uh, and um, those who weren't freed in that way and, and jo joined them that way, they they ran away and that and joined his joined the British. Uh, which basically was a, was what happened to the rest of the war. They they either they would either flock to British held New York, um, or they would flock to like in the South they would flock to Charleston. Uh, sometimes they would they would go to um, escape and go to Cornwallis's army when Cornwallis was was uh, was fighting in the South. Um, and they and they they so they all received their, received their freedom. The loyalists. The black loyalists, uh, they were evacuated from New York at, and also Charleston at the war's end. Um, many were sent to Canada. Uh, some, some might have been sent to the West Indies. Some, some went to England. Some were uh, basically sent to Africa to, to start uh, free black settlements there. Um, and I'm not saying that their, that their experience, I know, I know the experience of blacks in Canada was, was not always a good one, um, but, but they were given the freedom. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Uh, we've got some rave reviews here in the chat section for you. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> I want to <laughs> let everyone know that this session has been recorded and we are planning, um, the Friends of Washington Crossing Park are planning to make it available. I don't know the details of that yet. I don't think it'll be too long, but I'm sure um, they will um, put something out to let everybody know so you can watch it again and, and um, listen for things that may, you may have missed the first time because I know that I'll probably be doing the same thing. Uh, again, the book is called They Were Good Soldiers, African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783 by John Rees. And I also wanna let you know that there is a lecture uh, that Registration has not opened for it yet. It will open on October 25th, um, but the lecture is gonna be again on Zoom on December 6th and it's called Who Was Here? And I will highlight five or six uh, individuals who maybe you haven't heard of before and who were part of um, Washington Crossing the Delaware in the 10 crucial days. And we like to do that um, every December because it's, um, it's timely to do it then. So uh, thank you all, all of you. We had a lot of people for joining and um, I hope to see you again at our next lecture. And John, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. All righty. Everyone have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.